Chapters 22 and 23 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. A Way Out of the Trap. Mr. Hazelwood was very glad that Richard was away in London during this week. Excitement kept him feverish, and the fever grew as the number of days before Thresk was to come diminished. He would never have been able to keep his secret had every meal placed him under his son's eyes. He was free, too, from Stella herself. He met her but once on the Monday, and then it was in the deep lane leading towards the town. It was about five o'clock in the evening, and she was driving homewards in an open fly. Mr. Hazelwood stopped it, and went to the side. "'Richard is away, Stella, until Wednesday, as no doubt you knew,' he said. "'But I want you to come over to tea when he comes back. Will Friday suit you?' She had looked a little frightened when Mr. Hazelwood had called to the driver and stopped the carriage. But at his words the blood rushed into her cheeks and her eyes shone, and she pushed out her hand impulsively. "'Oh, thank you!' she cried. "'Of course I will come!' Not for a long time had he spoken to her with so kind a voice and a face so unclouded. She rejoiced at the change in him, and showed him such gratitude as is given only to those who render great service, so intense was her longing not to estrange Dick from his father. But she had become a shrewd observer under the stress of her evil destiny, and the moment of rejoicing once passed, she began to wonder what had brought about the change. She judged Mr. Hazelwood to be one of those weak and effervescing characters who can grow more obstinate in resentment than any others if their pride and self-esteem receive an injury. She had followed of late the windings of his thoughts. She put the result frankly to herself. He hates me. He holds me in horror. Why, then, the sudden change? She was in the mood to start at shadows, and when a little note was brought over to her on the Friday morning in Mr. Hazelwood's handwriting reminding her of her engagement, she was filled with a vague apprehension. The note was kindly in its terms, yet to her it had a menacing and sinister look. Had some stroke been planned against her? Was it to be delivered this afternoon? Dick came at half-past four from a village cricket match to fetch her. "'You are ready, Stella? Right!' for we can't spare very much time. I have a surprise for you. Stella asked him what it was, and he answered, There's a house for sale in Great Beating. I think that you would like it. Stella's face softened with a smile. Anywhere, Dick, she said, anywhere on earth. But here, best of all, he answered, not to run away, that's our policy. We'll make our home in our own south country. I arranged to take you over the house between half-past five and six this evening." They walked across to Little Beading, and were made welcome by Mr. Hazelwood. He came out to meet them in the garden, and nervousness made him kittenish and arch. "'How are you, Stella?' he inquired. "'But there's no need to ask. You look charming, and upon my word you grow younger every day. What a pretty hat! Yes, yes. Will you make tea while I telephone to the Pettifers? They seem to be late. He skipped off with an alacrity which was rather ridiculous, but Stella watched him go without any amusement. I am taken again into favour, she said doubtfully. That shouldn't distress you, Stella, replied Dick. Yet it does, for I ask myself why, and I don't understand this tea party. Mr. Hazelwood was so urgent that I should not forget it. Perhaps, however, I am inventing trouble. She shook herself free from her apprehensions, and followed Dick into the drawing-room, where the kettle was boiling, and the tea-service spread out. Stella went to the table, and opened the little mahogany caddy. "'How many are coming, Dick?' she asked. "'The Pettifers.' "'My enemies,' said Stella, laughing lightly. "'And you, and my father, and myself?' Five altogether,' said Stella. She began to measure out the tea into the teapot, but stopped suddenly in the middle of her work. "'But there are six cups,' she said. She counted them again to make sure, and at once her fears were reawakened. She turned to Dick, her face quite pale, and her big eyes dark with forebodings. So little now was needed to disquiet her 
Who is the sixth? Dick came closer to her and put his arm about her waist. I don't know, he said gently, but what can it matter to us, Stella? Think, my dear. No, of course, she replied, it can't make any difference. And she dipped her teaspoon once more into the caddy. But it's a little curious, isn't it, that your father didn't mention to you that there was another guest? Oh, wait a moment, said Dick. He did tell me there would be some visitor here today, but I forgot all about it. He told me at luncheon. There's a man from London coming down to have a look at his miniatures. His miniatures? Stella was pouring the hot water into the teapot. She replaced the kettle on its stand and shut the tea caddy. And Mr. Hazelwood didn't tell you the man's name, she said? I didn't ask him, answered Dick. He often has collectors down. I see. Her head was bent over the tea table. She was busy with her brew of tea. And I was specially asked to come this afternoon. I had a note this morning to remind me. She looked at the clock. Dick, if we are to see that house this afternoon, you had better change now before the visitors come. That's true, I will. Dick started towards the door, and he heard Stella come swiftly after him. He turned. There was so much trouble in her face. He caught her in his arms. Dick, she whispered, look at me, kiss me. Yes, I am sure of you. And she clung to him. Dick Hazelwood laughed. I think we ought to be fairly happy in that house. And she let him go with a smile, repeating her own words. Anywhere, Dick, anywhere on earth. She waited, watching him tenderly until the door was closed. Then she covered her face with her hands, and a sob burst from her lips. But the next moment she tore her hands away and looked wildly about the room. She ran to the writing table and scribbled a note. She thrust it into an envelope and gummed the flap securely down. Then she rang the bell and waited impatiently with a leaping heart until Hubbard came to the door. "'Did you ring, madam?' he asked. "'Yes. Has Mr. Thresk arrived yet?' She tried to control her face to speak in a careless and indifferent voice, but she was giddy and the room whirled before her eyes. "'Yes, madam,' the butler answered. And it seemed to Stella Ballantyne that once more she stood in the dock and heard the verdict spoken, only this time it had gone against her. That queer old shuffling butler became a figure of doom, his thin and piping voice uttered her condemnation. For here, without her knowledge, was Henry Thresk, and she was bidden to meet him with the Pettifers for witnesses. But it was Henry Thresk who had saved her before. She clung to that fact now. Mr. Thresk arrived a few minutes ago. Just before old Hazelwood had come forward out of the house to welcome her, no wonder he was in such high spirits. Very likely all that great show of kindliness and welcome was made only to keep her in the garden for a few necessary moments. "'Where is Mr. Thresk now?' she asked. "'In his room, madam.' "'You are quite sure?' "'Quite. Will you take this note to him, Hubbard?' And she held it out to the butler. "'Certainly, madam.' "'Will you take it at once? Give it into his hands, please.' Hubbard took the note and went out of the room. Never had he seemed to her so dilatory and slow. She stared at the door as though her sight could pierce the panels. She imagined him climbing the stairs with feet which loitered more at each fresh step. Someone would surely stop him and ask for whom the letter was intended. She went to the door which led into the hall, opened it, and listened. No one was descending the staircase, and she heard no voices. Then, above her, Hubbard knocked upon a door, a latch clicked as the door was opened, a hollow jarring sound followed as the door was sharply closed. Stella went back into the room. The letter had been delivered. At this moment Henry Thresk was reading it, and with a sinking heart she began to speculate in what spirit he would receive its message. Henry Thresk! The unhappy woman bestirred herself to remember him. He had grown dim to her of late. How much did she know of him? she asked herself. Once, years ago, there had been a month during which she had met him daily. She had given her heart to him, 
yet she had learned little or nothing of the man within the man's frame. She had not even made his acquaintance. That had been proved to her one memorable morning upon the top of Bigner Hill, when humiliation had so deeply seared her soul that only during this last month had it been healed. In the great extremities of her life, Henry Thresk had decided, not she, and he was a stranger to her. She beat her poor wings in vain against that ironic fact. Never had he done what she had expected. On Bigner Hill, in the law court at Bombay, he had equally surprised her. Now, once more, he held her destinies in his hand. What would he decide? What had he decided? Yes, he will have decided now, said Stella to herself, and a certain calm fell upon her troubled soul. Whatever was to be was now determined. She went back to the tea-table and waited. Henry Thresk had not much of the romantic in his character. He was a busy man, making the best and the most of the rewards which the years had brought to him, and slamming the door each day upon the day which had gone before. He made his life in the intellectual exercise of his profession and his membership of the House of Commons. Upon the deeps of the emotions he had closed a lid. Yet he had set out with a vague reluctance to little beating, and once his motor-car had passed Hindhead and dipped into the weald of Sussex, the reluctance had grown to a definite regret that he should once more have come into this country. His recollections were of a dim, far-off time, so dim that he could hardly believe that he had any very close relation with the young struggling man who had spent his first real holiday there. But the young man had been himself, and he had missed his opportunity high up on the downs by Arundel. Words which Jane Repton had spoken to him in Bombay came back to him on this summer afternoon like a refrain to the steady hum of his car. You can get what you want so long as you want it enough, but you cannot control the price you will have to pay. He had reached Little Beading only a few moments before Dick and Stella had crossed into the garden. He had been led by Hubbard into the library, where Mr. Hazelwood was sitting. From the windows he had even seen the thatched cottage where Stella Ballantyne dwelt, and its tiny garden bright with flowers. "'It is most kind of you to come,' Mr. Hazelwood had said. "'Ever since we had our little correspondence, I have been anxious to take your opinion upon my collection. Though how in the world you managed to find time to have an opinion at all upon the subject is most perplexing. I never open the times, but I see your name figuring in some important case.' "'And I, Mr. Hazelwood,' Thresk replied with a smile, never open my mail without receiving a pamphlet from you. I am not the only active man in the world. Even at that moment Mr. Hazelwood flushed with pleasure at the flattery. Little reflections, he cried, with a modest deprecation, worked out more or less to completeness, may I say that, in the quiet of a rural life, sparks from the tiny flame of my midnight oil. He picked up one pamphlet from a stack by his writing-table. You might perhaps care to look at The Prison Walls. Thresk drew back. I have got mine, Mr. Hazelwood, he said firmly. Every man in England should have one. No man in England has a right to two. Mr. Hazelwood fairly twittered with satisfaction. Here was a notable man from the outside world of affairs, who knew his work and held it in esteem. Obviously, then, he was right to take these few disagreeable twists and turns, which would ensure to him a mind free to pursue his labours. He looked down at the pamphlet, however, and his satisfaction was a trifle impaired. "'I am not sure that this is quite my best work,' he said timidly. "'A little hazardous, perhaps.' "'Would you say that?' asked Thresk. Yes, indeed I should. Mr. Hazelwood had the air of one making a considerable concession. The very title is inaccurate. The prison walls must cast no shadow. He repeated the sentence with a certain unction. The rhythm is perhaps not amiss, but the metaphor is untrue. My son pointed it out to me. 
as he says all walls cast shadows yes said thresk the trouble is to know where and on whom the shadow is going to fall mr hazelwood was startled by the careless words he came to earth heavily all was not as yet quite ready for the little trick which had been devised the pettifers had not arrived perhaps you would like to see your room mr thresk he said your bag has been taken up no doubt we will look at my miniatures after tea i shall be delighted said thresk as he followed hazelwood to the door but you must not expect too much knowledge from me oh cried his host with a laugh pettifer tells me you are a great authority then pettifer's wrong said thresk and so stopped pettifer pettifer isn't he a solicitor yes he told me that he knew you he married my sister they are both coming to tea with that he led thresk to his room and left him there the room was over the porch of the house and looked down the short level drive to the iron gates and the lane it was all familiar ground to thresk or rather to that other man with whom thresk's only connection was a dull throb at his heart a queer uneasiness and discomfort he leaned out of the window he could hear the river singing between the grass banks at the bottom of the garden behind him he would hear it through the night then came a knocking upon his door and he did not notice it at once it was repeated and he turned and said come in hubbard advanced with a note upon a salver mrs ballantyne asked me to give you this at once sir thresk stared at the butler the name was so apposite to his thoughts that he could not believe it had been uttered but the salver was held out to him and the handwriting upon the envelope removed his doubts he took it up said thank you in an absent voice and waited until the door was closed again and he was alone the last time he had seen that writing was eighteen months ago a little note of thanks blurred with tears and scribbled hastily and marked with no address had been handed to him in bombay stella ballantyne had disappeared then she was here now at little beading and his relationship with the young struggling barrister of ten years back suddenly became actual and near he tore open the envelope and read be prepared to see me be prepared to hear news of me i will have a talk with you afterwards if you like this is a trap be kind he stood for a while with the letter in his hand speculating upon its meaning until the wheels of a car grated on the gravel beneath his window the pettifers had come but thresk was in no hurry to descend he read the note through many times before he hid it away in his letter-case and went down the stairs end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three methods from france meanwhile stella ballantyne waited below she heard mr hazelwood in the hall greeting the pettifers with the false joviality which sat so ill upon him she imagined the shy nods and glances which told them that the trap was properly set mr hazelwood led them into the room is tea ready stella we won't wait for dick he said and stella took her place at the table she had her back to the door by which thresk would enter she had not a doubt that thus her chair had been deliberately placed he would be in the room and near to the table before he saw her he would not have a moment to prepare himself against the surprise of her presence stella listened for the sound of his footsteps in the hall she could not think of a single topic to talk about except the presence of that extra sixth cup and that she must not mention it if the tables were really to be turned upon her antagonists surprise must be visible upon her side when thresk did come in but she was not alone in finding conversation difficult embarrassment and expectancy weighed down the whole party so that they began suddenly to speak at once and simultaneously to stop robert pettifer however asked if dick was playing cricket and so gave harold hazelwood an opportunity no the match was over early said the old man and he settled himself in his armchair. 
"'I have given some study to the subject of cricket,' he said. "'You?' asked Stella, with a smile of surprise. Was he merely playing for time, she wondered? But he had the air of contentment with which he usually embarked upon his disquisitions. "'Yes, I do not consider our national pastime beneath a philosopher's attention. I have formed two theories about the game.' "'I am sure you have,' Robert Pettifer interposed. "'And I have invented two improvements, though I admit at once that they will have to wait until a more enlightened age than ours adopts them. In the first place,' and Mr. Hazelwood flourished a forefinger in the air, "'the game ought to be played with a soft ball.' There is at present a suggestion of violence about it which the use of a soft ball would entirely remove. Entirely, Mr. Pettifer agreed, and his wife exclaimed impatiently, Rubbish, Harold, rubbish! Stella broke nervously into the conversation. Violence? Why, even women play cricket, Mr. Hazelwood. I cannot, Stella, he returned, accept the view that whatever women do must necessarily be right, there are instances to the contrary. Yes, I come across a few of them in my office, Robert Pettifer said grimly, and once more embarrassment threatened to descend upon the party. But Mr. Hazelwood was off upon a favourite theme. His eyes glistened, and the object of the gathering vanished for the moment from his thoughts. And in the second place, he resumed, the losers should be accounted to have won the game. "'Yes, that must be right,' said Pettifer. "'Upon my word, you are in form, Hazelwood.' "'But why?' asked Mrs. Pettifer. Harold Hazelwood smiled upon her, as upon a child, and explained. "'Because by adopting that system you would do something to eradicate the spirit of rivalry, the desire to win, the ambition to beat somebody else which is at the bottom of half our national troubles.' and all our national success said pettifer hazelwood patted his brother-in-law upon the shoulder he looked at him indulgently you are a tory robert he said and implied that argument with such an one was mere futility he had still his hand upon pettifer's shoulder when the door opened stella saw by the change in his face that it was thresk who was entering but she did not move ah said mr hazelwood come over here and take a cup of tea thresk came forward to the table he seemed altogether unconscious that the eyes of the two men were upon him thank you i should like one he said and at the sound of his voice stella ballantyne turned around in her chair you she cried and the cry was pitched in a tone of pleasure and welcome of course you know mrs ballantyne said hazelwood he saw Stella rise from her chair and hold out her hand to Thresk with the colour of flame in her cheeks. "'You are surprised to see me again,' she said. Thresk took her hand cordially. "'I am delighted to see you again,' he replied. "'And I to see you,' said Stella, "'for I have never yet had a chance of thanking you.' And she spoke with so much frankness that even Pettifer was shaken in his suspicions. She turned upon Mr. Hazelwood with the mimicry of indignation. "'Do you know, Mr. Hazelwood, that you have done a very cruel thing?' Mr. Hazelwood was utterly discomfited by the failure of his plot, and when Stella attacked him so directly, he had not a doubt but that she had divined his treachery. "'I?' he gasped. "'Cruel? How?' "'In not telling me beforehand that I was to meet so good a friend of mine.' Her face relaxed to a smile as she added, "'I would have put on my best frock in his honour. Undoubtedly Stella carried off the honour of that encounter. She had at once driven the battle with spirit onto Hazelwood's own ground, and left him worsted and confused. But the end was not yet. Mr. Hazelwood waited for his son Richard, and when Richard appeared he exclaimed, "'Ah, here's my son!' Let me present him to you, Mr. Thresk, and there's the family. He leaned back with a smile in his eyes, watching Henry Thresk. Robert Pettifer watched too. The family? Thresk asked. Is Mrs. Ballantyne a relation, then? 
"'She is going to be,' said Dick. "'Yes,' Mr. Hazelwood explained, still beaming and still watchful. "'Richard and Stella are going to be married.' A pause followed, which was just perceptible before Thresk spoke again. But he had his face under control. He took the stroke without flinching. He turned to Dick with a smile. "'Some men have all the luck,' he said. And Dick, who had been looking at him in bewilderment, cried, "'Mr. Thresk! Not the Mr. Thresk to whom I owe so much?' "'The very man,' said Thresk, and Dick held out his hand to him gravely. "'Thank you,' he said. "'When I think of the horrible net of doubt and assumption in which Stella was coiled, I tell you I feel cold down to my spine even now. If you hadn't come forward with your facts—' "'Yes,' Thresk interposed. "'If I hadn't come forward with my facts—' but I couldn't well keep them to myself, could I? A few more words were said, and then Dick rose from his chair. Time's up, Stella, and he explained to Henry Thresk, we have to look over a house this afternoon. A house? Yes, I see, said Thresk, but he spoke slowly, and there was just audible a little inflection of doubt in his voice. Stella was listening for it, she heard it when her two antagonists noticed nothing. "'But, Dick,' she said quickly, "'we can put the inspection off.' "'Not on my account,' Thresk returned. "'There's no need for that.' He was not looking at Stella whilst he spoke, and she longed to see his face. She must know exactly how she stood with him, what he thought of her. She turned impulsively to Mr. Hazelwood. I haven't been asked, but may I come to dinner? You see, I owe a good deal to Mr. Thresk. Mr. Hazelwood was, for the moment, at a loss. He had not lost hope that between now and dinner-time explanations would be given which would banish Stella Ballantyne altogether from little beading. But he had no excuse ready, and he stammered out, Of course, my dear, didn't I ask you? I must have forgotten. I certainly expect you to dine with us to-night. Margaret will no doubt be here. Margaret Pettifer had taken little part in the conversation about the tea-table. She sat in frigid hostility, speaking only when politeness commanded. She accepted her brother's invitation with a monosyllable. "'Thank you,' said Stella, and she faced Henry Thresk, looking him straight in the eyes, but not daring to lay any special stress upon the words. Then I shall see you to-night. Thresk read in her face a prayer that he should hold his hand until she had a chance to speak with him. She turned away and went from the room with Dick Hazelwood. The old man rose as soon as the door was closed. Now we might have a look at the miniatures, Mr. Thresk. You will excuse us, Margaret, won't you? Of course, she answered, upon a nod from her husband. The two men passed through the doors into the great library, whilst Thresk took a more ceremonious leave of Mrs. Pettifer, and, as Hazelwood opened the doors of his cabinets, Robert Pettifer said in a whisper, "'That was a pretty good failure, I must say, and it was my idea, too.' "'Yes,' replied Hazelwood, in a voice as low. "'What do you think?' "'That they share no secret.' "'You are satisfied, then?' I didn't say that, and Thresk himself appeared in the doorway, and went across to the writing-table upon which Hazelwood had just laid a drawer in which miniatures were ranged. "'I haven't met you,' said Pettifer, "'since you led for us in the great Birmingham will suit.' "'No,' answered Thresk, as he took his seat at the table. "'It wasn't quite such a tough fight as I expected. You see, there wasn't one really reliable witness for the defence. No, said Pettifer grimly, if there had been, we should have been beaten. Mr. Hazelwood began to point out this and that miniature of his collection, bending over Thresk as he did so. It seemed that the two collectors were quite lost in their common hobby, until Robert Pettifer gave the signal. Then Mr. Hazelwood began. I am very glad to meet you, Mr. Thresk, for reasons quite outside these miniatures of mine. He spoke with a noticeable awkwardness, yet Henry Thresk disregarded it altogether. 
Oh, he said carelessly. Yes, being Richard's father, I am naturally concerned in everything which affects him nearly. The trial of Stella Ballantyne, for instance. Thresk bent his head down over the tray. Quite so, he said. He pointed to a miniature. I saw that at Christie's and coveted it myself. Did you? Mr. Hazelwood asked, and he almost offered it as a bribe. Now, you gave evidence, Mr. Thresk. Thresk never lifted his head. You have no doubt read the evidence I gave, he said, peering from this delicate jewel of the painter's art to that. To be sure. And since your son is engaged to Mrs. Ballantyne, I suppose that you were satisfied with it? And he paused to give a trifle of significance to his next words, as the jury was? Uh, yes, of course, Mr. Hazelwood stammered, but a witness, I think, only answers the questions put to him. That is so, said Thresk, if he is a wise witness. He took one of the miniatures out of the drawer and held it to the light. But Mr. Hazelwood was not to be deterred. And subsequent reflection, he continued obstinately, might suggest that all the questions which could throw light upon the trial had not been put. Thresk replaced the miniature in the drawer in front of him, and leaned back in his chair. He looked now straight at Mr. Hazelwood. "'It was not, I take it, in order to put those questions to me, that you were kind enough, Mr. Hazelwood, to ask me to give my opinion on your miniatures? For that would have been setting a trap for me, wouldn't it?' Hazelwood stared at Thresk with the bland innocence of a child. Oh, no, no, he declared, and then an insinuating smile beamed upon his long, thin face. Only, since you are here, and since so much is at stake for me, my son's happiness, I hope that you might perhaps give us an answer or two which would disperse the doubts of some suspicious people. Who were they? asked Thresk. Neighbors of ours, replied Hazelwood and thereupon Robert Pettifer stepped forward. He had remained aloof and silent until this moment. Now he spoke shortly, but he spoke to the point. I, for one. Thresk turned with a smile upon Pettifer. I thought so. I recognized Mr. Pettifer's hand in all this. But he ought to know that the sudden confrontation of a suspected person with unexpected witnesses takes place in those countries where the method is practised before the trial, not, as you so ingeniously arranged it this afternoon, two years after the verdict has been given. Robert Pettifer turned red. Then he looked whimsically across the table at his brother-in-law. We had better make a clean breast of it, Hazelwood. I think so, said Thresk gently. Pettifer came a step nearer. We are in the wrong, he said bluntly. But we have an excuse. Our trouble is very great. Here's my brother-in-law to begin with, whose whole creed of life has been to deride the authority of conventional man, to tilt against established opinion. Mrs. Ballantyne comes back from her trial in Bombay to make her home again at Little Beading. Hazelwood champions her, not for her sake, but for the sake of his theories. It pleases his vanity. Now he can prove that he is not as others are. Mr. Hazelwood did not relish this merciless analysis of his character. He twisted in his chair, he uttered a murmur of protest. But Robert Pettifer waved him down and continued. So he brings her to his house. He canvasses for her. He throws his son in her way. She has beauty. She has something more than beauty. She stands apart as a woman who has walked through fire. She has suffered very much. Look at it how one will, she has suffered beyond her deserts. She has pretty, deferential ways which make their inevitable appeal to women as to men. In a word, Hazelwood sets the ball rolling, and it gets beyond his reach. Thresk nodded. Yes, I understand that. Finally, Hazelwood's son falls in love with her. 
not a boy mine but a man claiming a man's right to marry where he loves and at once in hazelwood conventional man awakes dear me no interposed harold hazelwood but i say yes pettifer continued imperturbably conventional man awakes in him and cries loudly against the marriage then there's myself i'm fond of dick i have no child he will be my heir and i am not poor he is doing well in his profession to be an instructor of the staff corps at his age means hard work keenness ability i look forward to a great career i am very fond of him and understand me mr thresk he checked his speech and weighed his words very carefully i wouldn't say that he shouldn't marry stella ballantyne just because stella ballantyne has lain under a grave charge of which she has been acquitted no i may be as formal as my brother-in-law thinks but i hold a wider faith than that but i am not satisfied that is the truth mr thresk i am not sure of what happened in that tent in faraway chitipur after you had ridden away to catch the night mail to bombay robert pettifer had made his confession simply and with some dignity thresk looked at him for a few moments was he wondering whether he could answer the questions was he hesitating through anger at the trick which had been played upon him pettifer could not tell he waited in suspense thresk pushed his chair back suddenly and came forward from behind the table ask your questions he said you consent to answer them mr hazelwood cried joyously and thresk replied with coldness i must for if i don't consent your suspicions at once are double what they were but i am not pleased oh we practised a little diplomacy said hazelwood making light of his offence diplomacy for the first time a gleam of anger shone in thresk's eyes you have got me to your house by a trick you have abused your position as my host and but that i should injure a woman whom life has done nothing but injure i should go out of your door this instant he turned his back upon harold hazelwood and sat down in a chair opposite to robert pettifer a little round table separated them Pettifer, seated upon a couch, took from his pocket the envelope with the press cuttings, and spread them on the table in front of him. Thresk lolled back in his chair. It was plain that he was in no terror of Pettifer's examination. "'I am at your service,' he said. End of chapter 23《Chapters 24 and 25 of the Witness for the Defence by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter 24 The Witness The afternoon sunlight poured into the room, golden and clear. Outside the open windows the garden was noisy with birds, and the river babbled between its banks. Henry Thresk shut his ears against the music. For all his appearance of ease, he dreaded the encounter which was now begun. Pettifer he knew to be a shrewd man. He watched him methodically arranging his press cuttings in front of him. Pettifer might well find some weak point in his story, which he himself had not discovered. And, whatever course he was minded afterwards to take, here and now he was determined once more to fight Stella's battle. I need not go back on the facts of the trial, said Pettifer. They are fresh enough in your memory, no doubt. Your theory, as I understand it, ran as follows. While you were mounting your camel on the edge of the camp to return to the station, and Ballantyne was at your side, the thief whose arm you had both seen under the tent wall, not knowing that now you had the photograph of Bahadur Salak which he wished to steal, slipped into the tent unperceived, took up the rook rifle, which was standing by Mrs. Ballantyne's writing-table, Thresk interposed. Loaded it. The cartridges were lying open in a drawer. And shot Ballantyne on his return. 
Yes, Thresk agreed. In addition, you must remember that when Captain Ballantyne was found an hour or so later, Mrs. Ballantyne was in bed and asleep. Quite so, said Pettifer. In brief, Mr. Thresk, you supplied a reasonable motive for the crime and some evidence of a criminal. And I admit that on your testimony the jury returned the only verdict which it was possible to give. What troubles you then? Henry Thresk asked and Pettifer replied dryly. Various points. Here's one, a minor one. If Captain Ballantyne was shot by a thief detected in the act of thieving, why should that thief risk capture and death by dragging Captain Ballantyne's body out into the open? It seems to be the last thing which he would naturally do. Thresk shrugged his shoulders. I can't explain that. It is perhaps possible that not finding the photograph he fell into a blind rage and satisfied it by violence towards the dead man. Dead or dying, Mr. Pettifer corrected. There seems to have been some little doubt upon that point. But your theory's a little weak, isn't it? To get away unseen would be that thief's first preoccupation, surely. Reasoning as you and I are doing here quietly, at our ease in this room, no doubt you are right, Mr. Pettifer. But criminals are court because they don't reason quietly when they have just committed a crime. The behaviour of a man whose mind is influenced by that condition cannot be explained always by any laws of psychology. He may be in a wild panic. He may act as madmen act, or like a child in a rage. And if my explanation is weak, it's no weaker than the only other hypothesis that Mrs. Ballantyne herself dragged him into the open. Mr. Pettifer shook his head. I am not so sure. I can conceive a condition of horror in the wife, horror at what she had done, which would make that act not merely possible, but almost inevitable. I make no claims to being an imaginative man, Mr. Thresk, but I try to put myself into the position of the wife. And he described with the vividness for which Thresk was not prepared the scene as he saw it. She goes to bed, she undresses and goes to bed. She must do that if she is to escape. She puts out her light, she lies in the dark awake, and, under the same roof, close to her, in the dark too, is lying the man she has killed. Just a short passage separates her from him. There are no doors, mind that, Mr. Thresk, no doors to lock and bolt, merely a grass screen which you could lift with your forefinger. Wouldn't any and every one of the little cracks and sounds and breathings, of which the quietest and stillest night is full, sound to her like the approach of the dead man? The faintest breath of air would seem a draught made by the swinging of the grass curtain, as it was stealthily lifted, lifted by the dead man. No, Mr. Thresk, the wife is just the one person I could imagine who would do that needless barbarous violence of dragging the body into the open, and she would do it, not out of cruelty, but because she must or go mad. Thresk listened without a movement until Robert Pettifer had finished. Then he said, You know Mrs. Ballantyne. Has she the strength which she must have had to drag a heavy man across the carpet of a tent and fling him outside? Not now, not before. But just at the moment? You argued, Mr. Thresk, that it is impossible to foresee what people will do under the immediate knowledge that they have committed a capital crime. I agree. But I go a little further. I say that they will also exhibit a physical strength with which it would be otherwise impossible to credit them. Fear lends it to them. Yes, Thresk interrupted quickly. But don't you see, Mr. Pettifer? that you are implying the existence of an emotion in Mrs. Ballantyne which the facts prove her to have been without? Fear? Panic? She was found quietly asleep in her bed by the ayah when she came to call her in the morning. There's no doubt of that. The ayah was never for a moment shaken upon that point. The psychology of crime is a curious and surprising study, Mr. Pettifer, and I know of no case where terror has acted as a sleeping draught. Mr. Pettifer smiled, and turned altogether away from the question. It is, as I said, a minor point, 
and perhaps one from which any sort of inference would be unsafe. It interested me. I lay no great stress upon it. He dismissed the point carelessly, to the momentary amusement of Henry Thresk. The art of slipping away from defeat had been practised with greater skill. Thresk lost some part of his apprehension, but none of his watchfulness. "'Now, however, we come to something very different,' said Pettifer, hitching himself a little closer to his table, and fixing his eyes upon Thresk. The case for the prosecution ran like this. Stephen Ballantyne was, though a man of great ability, a secret drunkard who humiliated his wife in public and beat her in private. She went in terror of him. She bore on more than one occasion the marks of his violence and upon that night in Chitipur, perhaps in a panic, and very likely under extreme provocation, she snatched up her rook rifle and put an end to the whole bad business. Uh, yes, Thresk agreed, that was the case for the Crown. Yes, and throughout the sittings at the stipendiary's inquiry, before you came upon the scene, that theory was clearly developed. Yes. Thresk's confidence vanished as quickly as it had come. He realized whither Pettifer's questions were leading. There was a definitely weak link in his story, and Pettifer had noticed it and was testing it. Now, the solicitor continued, and this is the important point. What was the answer to that charge foreshadowed by the defense during those days before you appeared? Thresk answered the question quickly, if answer it could be called. The defence had not formulated any answer. I came forward before the case for the Crown finished. Quite so. But Mrs. Ballantyne's counsel did cross-examine the witnesses for the prosecution. We must not forget that, Mr. Thresk. And from the cross-examination it is quite clear what answer he was going to make. He was going, not to deny that Mrs. Ballantyne shot her husband, but to plead that she had shot him in self-defence. "'Oh,' said Thresk, "'and where do you find that?' He had no doubt himself in what portion of the report of the trial a proof of Pettifer's statement was to be discovered, but he made a creditable show of surprise that anyone should hold that opinion at all. Pettifer selected a column of newspapers from his cuttings. "'Listen,' he said, Mr. Repton, a friend of Mrs. Ballantyne, was called upon a subpoena by the Crown, and he testified that while he was a collector at Agra, he went up with his wife from the plains to the hill station of Mussoorie during a hot weather. The Ballantynes went up at the same time and occupied a bungalow next to Repton's. One night Repton's house was broken into. He went across to Ballantyne the next morning and advised him in the presence of his wife to sleep with a revolver under his pillow. "'Yes, I remember that,' said Thresk. He had indeed cause to remember it very well, for it was just this evidence given by Repton, with its clear implication of the line which the defence meant to take, that had sent him in a hurry to Mrs. Ballantyne's solicitor. Pettifer continued by reading Repton's words slowly and with emphasis. Mrs. Ballantyne then turned very pale, and running after me down the garden like a distracted woman cried, Why did you tell him to do that? It will some night mean my death. This statement, Mr. Thresk, was elicited in cross-examination by Mrs. Ballantyne's counsel, and it could only mean that he intended to set up a plea of self-defence. I find it a little difficult to reconcile that intention with the story you subsequently told. Henry Thresk, for his part, knew that it was not merely difficult. It was, in fact, impossible. Mr. Pettifer had read the evidence with an accurate discrimination. The plea of self-defence was here foreshadowed, and it was just the certainty that the defence was going to rely upon it for a verdict which had brought Henry Thresk himself into the witness-box at Bombay. Given all that was known of Stephen Ballantyne, and of the life he had led his unhappy wife, the defence would have been a good one, but for a single fact, the discovery of Ballantyne's body outside the tent. 
no plea of self-defence could safely be left to cover that thresk himself wondered at it it struck at public sympathy it seemed the act of a person insensate and vindictive therefore he had come forward with his story but mr pettifer was not to know it there are three things for you to remember said thresk in the first place it is too early to assume that self-defence was going to be the plea assumptions in a case of this kind are very dangerous mr pettifer they may lead to an irreparable injustice we must keep to the fact that no plea of self-defence was ever formulated in the second place mrs ballantyne was brought down to bombay in a state of complete collapse her married life had been a torture to her she broke down at the end of it she was indifferent to anything that might happen pettifer nodded yes i can understand that it followed that her advisers had to act upon their own initiative and the third point pettifer asked well it's not so much a point as an opinion of mine but i hold it strongly her counsel mishandled the case pettifer pursed up his lips and grunted he tapped a finger once or twice on the table in front of him he looked towards thresk as if all was not quite said harold hazlewood to whom the position of a neglected listener was rare and unpalatable saw an opportunity for intervention the three points are perhaps not very conclusive he said thresk turned towards him coldly i promised to answer such questions as mr pettifer put to me i am doing that i did not undertake to discuss the value of my answers afterwards no no quite so murmured mr hazlewood we are very grateful i am sure and he left once more the argument to pettifer then i come to the next question mr thresk at some moment in this inquiry you of your own account put yourself into communication with mrs ballantyne's advisers and volunteered your evidence yes isn't it strange that the defence did not at the very outset get into communication with you no replied thresk here he was at his ease he had laid his plans well in bombay mr pettifer might go on asking questions until midnight upon this point thresk could meet him it was not at all strange it was not known that i could throw any light upon the affair at all all that passed between ballantyne and myself passed when we were alone and ballantyne was now dead yes but you had dined with the ballantynes on that night surely it's strange that since you were in bombay mrs ballantyne's advisers did not seek you out yes yes added mr hazlewood very strange indeed mr thresk since you were in bombay and he looked up at the ceiling and joined the tips of his fingers his whole attitude a confident question answer that if you can thresk turned patiently round hasn't it occurred to you mr hazlewood that it is still more strange that the prosecution did not at once approach me yes said pettifer suddenly that question too has troubled me and thresk turned back again you see he explained i was not known to be in bombay at all on the contrary i was supposed to be somewhere in the red sea or the mediterranean on my way back to england mr pettifer looked up in surprise the statement was news to him and if true provided a natural explanation of some of his chief perplexities let me understand that and there was a change in his voice which thresk was quick to detect there was less hostility certainly thresk answered i left the tent just before eleven to catch the bombay mail i was returning direct to england the reason why ballantyne asked me to take the photograph of bahadur salak was that since i was going on board straight from the train it could be no danger to me then why didn't you go straight on board asked pettifer i'll tell you thresk replied i thought the matter over on the journey down to bombay and i came to the conclusion that since the photograph might be wanted at salak's trial i had better take it to the governor's house at bombay but government house is out at malabar point four miles from the quays 
I took the photograph out myself, and so I missed the boat. But there was an announcement in the papers that I had sailed, and in fact the consul at Marseilles came on board at that port to inquire for me on instructions from the Indian government. Mr. Pettifer leaned back. Yes, I see, he said thoughtfully. That makes a difference, a big difference. Then he sat upright again and said sharply, You were in Bombay then, when Mrs. Ballantyne was brought down from Chitipur? Yes. And when the case for the Crown was started? Yes. And when the Crown's witnesses were cross-examined? Yes. Why did you wait then all that time before you came forward? Pettifer put the question with an air of triumph. Why, Mr. Thresk, did you wait till the very moment when Mrs. Ballantyne was going to be definitely committed to a particular line of defence before you announced that you could clear up the mystery? Doesn't it rather look as if you had remained hidden on the chance of prosecution breaking down, and had only come forward when you realised that to-morrow self-defence would be pleaded, the firing of that rook rifle admitted, and a terrible risk of a verdict of guilty run? Thresk agreed without a moment's hesitation. "'But that's the truth, Mr. Pettifer,' he said, and Mr. Pettifer sprang up. "'What?' "'Consider my position.' Thresk drew up his chair close to the table. A barrister, who was beginning to have one of the large practices, the courts opening in London, briefs awaiting me, cases on which I had already advised coming on. I had already lost a fortnight. That was bad enough. But if I came forward with my story, I must wait in Bombay not merely for a fortnight, but until the whole trial was completed, as in the end I had to do. Of course I hoped that the prosecution would break down. Of course I didn't intervene until it was absolutely necessary in the interest of justice that I should. He spoke so calmly, and there was so much reason in what he said, that Pettifer could not but be convinced. "'I see,' he said. "'I see. Uh, yes, that's not to be disputed.' He remained silent for a few moments. Then he shuffled his papers together and replaced them in the envelope. It seemed that his examination was over. Thresk rose from his chair. "'You have no more questions to ask me?' he inquired. "'One more.' Pettifer came round the table and stood in front of Henry Thresk. "'Did you know Mrs. Ballantyne before you went to Chitipur?' "'Yes,' Thresk replied. "'Had you seen her lately?' "'No.' When had you last seen her? Eight years before, in this neighbourhood. I spent a holiday close by. Her father and mother were then alive. I had not seen her since. I did not even know that she was in India and married until I was told so in Bombay. Thresk was prepared for that question. He had the truth ready, and he spoke it frankly. Mr. Pettifer turned away to Hazelwood, who was watching him expectantly. We have nothing more to do, Hazelwood, but to thank Mr. Thresk for answering our questions, and to apologize to him for having put them. Mr. Hazelwood was utterly disconcerted. After all, then, the marriage must take place. The plot had ignominiously failed. The great questions which were to banish Stella Ballantyne from little beading had been put and answered. He sat like a man stricken by calamity. He stammered out reluctantly a few words, to which Thresk paid little heed. "'You are satisfied, then?' he asked of Pettifer. And Pettifer showed him unexpectedly a cordial and good-humoured face. "'Yes. Let me say to you, Mr. Thresk, that ever since I began to study this case, I have wished less and less to bear hardly upon Mrs. Ballantyne. As I read those columns of evidence, the heavy figure of Stephen Ballantyne took life again, but a very sinister life. And when I look at Stella, and think of what she went through during the years of her married life, while we were comfortably here at home, I cannot but feel a shiver of discomfort. Yes, I am satisfied, and I am glad that I am satisfied. And with a smile which suddenly illumined his dry, parched face, he held out his hand to Henry Thresk. 
it was perhaps as well that the questions were over for even while pettifer was speaking stella's voice was heard in the hall pettifer had just time to thrust away the envelope with the cuttings into a drawer before she came into the room with dick she had been forced to leave the three men together but she had dreaded it during that one hour of absence she had lived through a lifetime of terror and anxiety what would thresk tell them what was he now telling them she was like one waiting downstairs while a surgical operation is being performed in the theatre above she had hurried dick back to little deeding and when she came into the room her eyes roamed round in suspense from thresk to hazelwood from hazelwood to pettifer she saw the tray of miniatures upon the table you admire the collection she said to thresk very much he answered and pettifer took her by the arm and in a voice of kindness which she had never heard him use before he said now tell me about your house that's much more interesting end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five in the library henry thresk took mrs pettifer in to dinner that night and she found him poor company he tried indeed by fits and starts to entertain her but his thoughts were elsewhere he was in a great pother and trouble about stella ballantyne who sat over against him on the other side of the table she wore no traces of the consternation which his words had caused her a couple of hours before she had come dressed in a slim gown of shimmering blue with her small head erect a smile upon her lips and a bright colour in her cheeks thresk hardly knew her he had to tell himself again and again that this was the stella ballantyne whom he had known here and in india she was not the girl who had ridden with him upon the downs and made one month of his life very memorable and one day a shameful recollection nor was she the stricken creature of the tent in chitipur she was a woman sure of her resources radiant in her beauty confident that what she wore was her colour and gave her her value yet her trouble was greater than thresk's and many a time during the course of that dinner when she felt his eyes resting upon her her heart sank in fear she sought his company after dinner but she had no chance of a private word with him old mr hazelwood took care of that one moment stella must sing at another she must play a rubber of bridge he at all events had not laid aside his enmity and suspected some understanding between her and his guest at eleven mrs pettifer took her leave she came across the room to henry thresk are you staying over to-morrow she asked and thresk with a laugh answered i wish that i could but i have to catch an early train to london even to-night my day's work's not over i must sit up for an hour or two over a brief stella rose at the same time as mrs pettifer i was hoping that you would be able to come across and see my little cottage to-morrow morning she said thresk hesitated as he took her hand i should very much like to see it he said he was in a very great difficulty and was not sure that a letter was not the better if the more cowardly way out of it if i could find the time try said she she could say no more for mr hazelwood was at her elbow and dick was waiting to take her home it was a dark clear night a sky of stars overarched the earth but there was no moon and though light shone brightly even at a great distance there was no glimmer from the road beneath their feet dick held her close in his arms at the door of her cottage she was very still and passive you are tired he asked i think so well to-night has seen the last of our trouble stella she did not answer him at once her hands clung about his shoulders and with her face smothered in his coat she whispered dick i couldn't go on without you now i couldn't i wouldn't there was a note of passionate despair in her voice which made her words suddenly terrible to him he took her and held her a little away from him peering into her face what are you saying stella he asked sternly you know that nothing can come between us you break my heart when you talk like that 
He drew her again into his arms. Is your maid waiting up for you? No. Call her, then, while I wait here. Let me see the light in her room. I want her to sleep with you tonight. There's no need, Dick, she answered. I am unstrung tonight. I said more than I meant. I swear to you there's no need. He raised his head and kissed her on the lips. I trust you, Stella, he said gently, and she answered him in a low, trembling voice of so much tenderness and love that he was reassured. Oh, you may, my dear, you may. She went up to her room and turned on the light, and sat down in her chair just as she had done after her first dinner at Little Beading. She had foreseen then all the troubles which had since beset her, but she had seemed to have passed through them until this afternoon. Over there in the library of the big house was Henry Thresk, the stranger. Very likely he was at this moment writing to her. If he had only consented to come over in the morning and give her a chance of pleading with him, she went to the window, and drawing up the blind, leaned her head out and looked across the meadow. In the library one of the long windows stood open, and the curtain was not drawn. The room was full of light. Henry Thresk was there. He had befriended her this afternoon, as he had befriended her at Bombay, for the second time he had won the victory for her, but the very next moment he had warned her that the end was not yet. He would send her a letter, she had not a doubt of it. She had not a doubt either of the message which the letter would bring. A sound rose to her ears from the gravel path below her window, the sound of a slight, involuntary movement. Stella drew sharply back. Then she leaned out again and called softly, Dick. He was standing a little to the left of the window, out of reach of the light which streamed out upon the darkness from the room behind her. He moved forward now. Oh, Dick, why are you waiting? I wanted to be sure that all was right, Stella. I gave you my word, Dick, she whispered, and she wished him good night again and waited till the sound of his footsteps had altogether died away. He went back to the house and found Thresk still at work in the library. I don't want to interrupt you, he said, but I must thank you again. I can't tell you what I owe you. She's pretty wonderful, isn't she? I feel coarse beside her, I tell you. I couldn't talk like this to anyone else, but you're so sympathetic. Henry Thresk had responded with nothing more than a grunt. He sat slashing at his brief with a blue pencil, all the while that Dick Hazelwood was speaking, and wishing that he would go to bed. Dick, however, was unabashed. Did you ever see a woman look so well in a blue frock, or in a black one, either? There's a sort of painted thing she wears sometimes, too. Well, perhaps I had better go to bed. I think it would be wise, said Thresk. Young Hazelwood went over to the table in the corner and lit his candle. You'll shut that window before you go to bed, won't you? Yes. Hazelwood filled for himself a glass of barley water and drank it, contemplating Henry Thresk over the rim. Then he went back to him, carrying his candle in his hand. "'Why don't you get married, Mr. Thresk?' he asked. "'You ought to, you know. Men run to seed so if they don't.' "'Thank you,' said Thresk. The tone was not cordial, but mere words were an invitation to Dick Hazelwood at this moment. He sat down and placed his lighted candle on the table between Thresk and himself. "'I am thirty-four years old,' he said and Thresk interposed without glancing up from his foolscap. "'From your style of conversation, I find that very difficult to believe, Captain Hazelwood.' "'I have wasted thirty-four complete years of twelve months each,' continued the ecstatic captain, who appeared to think that on the very day of his birth he would have recognized his soul's mate. "'Just jogging along with the world,' A miracle about one, and not half an eye to perceive it, you know. No, I don't, Thresk observed. He lifted the candle and held it out to Dick. Dick got up and took it. Thank you, he said. That was very kind of you. I told you, didn't I, how sympathetic I thought you? Thresk was not proof against his companion's pertinacity. 
he broke into a laugh are you going to bed he pleaded and dick hazelwood replied yes i am suddenly his tone changed stella had a very good friend in you mr thresk i am sure she still has one and without waiting for any answer he went upstairs his bedroom was near to the front in the side of the house it commanded a view of the meadow and the cottage and he rejoiced to see that all stella's windows were dark the library was out of sight round the corner at the back but a glare of light from the open door spread out over the lawn hazelwood looked at his watch it was just midnight he went to bed and slept in the library thresk strove to concentrate his thoughts upon his brief but he could not and he threw it aside at last there was a letter to be written and until it was written and done with his thoughts would not be free he went over to the writing-table and wrote it but it took a long while in the composition and the clock upon the top of the stable was striking one when at last he had finished and sealed it up i'll post it in the morning at the station he resolved and he went to the window to close it but as he touched it a slight figure wrapped in a dark cloak came out of the darkness at the side and stepped past him into the room he swung round and saw stella ballantyne you he exclaimed you must be mad i had to come she said standing well away from the window in the centre of the room as though she thought he would drive her out i heard you say you would be sitting late here how long have you been waiting out there a little while i don't know not very long i wasn't sure that you were alone thresk closed the window and drew the curtain across it then he crossed the room and locked the doors leading into the dining-room and the hall there was no need for you to come he said in a low voice i have written to you yes she nodded her head that's why i had to come this afternoon you spoke of leaving your pipe behind i understood and as he drew the letter from his pocket she recoiled from it no it has never been written i came in time to prevent its being written you only had an idea of writing say that you are my friend she took the letter from him now and tore it across and again across see it has never been written at all but thresk only shook his head i am very sorry i see to-night the stricken woman of the tent in chitipur i am very sorry and stella caught at the commiseration in his voice she dropped the cloak from her shoulders she was dressed as she had been at dinner some hours before but all her radiance had gone her cheeks trembled and her eyes pleaded desperately sorry i knew you would be you are not hard you couldn't be you must come close day by day in your life to so much that is pitiful one can talk to you and you'll understand this is my first chance the first real chance i ever had henry the very first thresk looked backwards over the years of stella ballantyne's unhappy life it came upon him with a shock that what she said was the bare truth and remorse followed hard upon the heels of the shock this was her first real chance and he himself was to blame that it had come no earlier the first chance of a life worth the living it had been in his hands to give her and he had refused to give it years ago on bignor hill it's quite true he admitted but i don't ask you to give it up stella she looked at him eagerly no you would have understood that if you had read my letter instead of tearing it up i only ask you to tell your lover the truth he knows it she said sullenly no he does he does she protested her voice rising to a low cry hush you'll be heard said thresk and she listened for a moment anxiously but there was no sound of any one stirring in the house we are safe here she said no one sleeps above us henry he knows the truth would you be here now if he did i came because this afternoon you seemed to be threatening me 
i didn't understand i couldn't sleep i saw the light in this room i came to ask you what you meant that's all i'll tell you what i meant said thresk and stella with her eyes fixed upon him sank down upon a chair i left my pipe behind me in the tent on the night i dined with you your lover stella doesn't know that i came back to fetch it he doesn't know that you were standing by the table and stella ballantyne broke in upon him to silence the words upon his lips there was no reason why he should know she exclaimed it had nothing to do with what happened we know what happened there was a thief and thresk turned to her then with such a look of sheer amazement upon his face that she faltered and her voice died to a murmur of words a lean brown arm a hand as delicate as a woman's there was no thief he said quietly there was a man delirious with drink who imagined one there was you with the bruises on your throat and the unutterable misery in your eyes and a little rifle in your hands there was no one else she ceased to argue she sat looking straight in front of her with a stubborn face and a resolution to cling at all costs to her chance of happiness come stella thresk pleaded i don't say tell every one i do say tell him for unless you do i must stella stared at him you she said you would tell him that you came back into the tent and saw me oh much more that i lied at the trial that the story which secured your acquittal was false that i made it up to save you that i told it again this afternoon to give you a chance of slipping out from an impossible position she looked at thresk for a moment in terror then her expression changed a wave of relief swept over her she laughed in thresk's face you are trying to frighten me she said only i know you do you realize what it would mean to you if it were ever really known that you had lied at the trial yes your ruin your absolute ruin worse than that prison perhaps yes stella laughed again and you would run the risk of the truth becoming known by telling it to so much as one person no no another perhaps not you you have had one dream all your life to rise out of obscurity to get on in the world to hold the highest positions everything and every one has been sacrificed to its fulfilment oh who should know better than i and she struck her hands together sharply as she uttered that bitter cry you have lain down late and risen early and you have got on well are you the man to throw away all this work and success now that they touch fulfilment you are in the chariot will you step down and run tied to the wheels will you stand up and say there was a trial i perjured myself no another perhaps not you henry thresk had no answer to that indictment all of it was true except its inference and it was no news to him he made no effort to defend himself you are not very generous stella he replied gently for if i lied i saved you by the lie stella was softened by the words her voice lost its hardness she reached out her hand in an apology and laid it on his arm oh i know i sent you a little word of thanks when you gave me my freedom but it won't be of much value to me if i lose what i am fighting for now so you use every weapon yes but this one breaks in your hand he said firmly the thing you think it incredible that i should do i shall do none the less stella looked at him in despair she could no longer doubt that he really meant his words he was really resolved to make this sacrifice of himself and her and why why should he interfere you save me one day to destroy me the next she said no he replied i don't think i shall do that stella and he explained to her what drove him on i had no idea why hazel would ask me here 
Had I suspected it, I say frankly that I should have refused to come. But I am here. The trouble's once more at my door, but in a new shape. There's this man, young Hazelwood. I can't forget him. You will be marrying him by the help of a lie I told. He loves me, she cried. Then he can bear the truth, answered Thresk. He pulled up a chair opposite to that in which Stella sat. I want you to understand me, if you will. I don't want you to think me harsh or cruel. I told a lie upon my oath in the witness box. I violated my traditions. I struck at my belief in the value of my own profession. And such beliefs mean a good deal to any man. Stella stirred impatiently. What words were these? Traditions. The value of a profession. I am not laying stress upon them, Stella, but they count, Thresk continued. And I am telling you that they count, because I am going to add that I should tell that lie again to-morrow, were the trial to-morrow and you a prisoner. I should tell it again to save you again. Yes, to save you. But when you go and, let me put it very plainly, use that lie to your advantage, why then I am bound to cry stop. Don't you see that? You are using the lie to marry a man and keep him in ignorance of the truth. You can't do that, Stella. You would be miserable yourself if you did all your life. You would never feel safe for a moment. You would be haunted by a fear that some day he would learn the truth and not from you. Oh, I am sure of it. He caught her hands and pressed them earnestly. Tell him, Stella, tell him. Stella Ballantyne rose to her feet with a strange look upon her face. Her eyes half closed as though to shut out a vision of past horrors. She turned to Thresk with a white face and her hands tightly clenched. You don't know what happened on that night after you rode away to catch your train? No. I think you ought to know before you sit in judgment. And so at last in that quiet library under the Sussex Downs, the tragic story of that night was told. For Thresk, as he listened and watched, its terrors lived again in the eyes and the hushed voice of Stella Ballantyne. The dark walls seemed to fall back and dissolve. The moonlit plain of far away Chitipur stretched away in front of him to the dim hill where the old silent palaces crumbled and midway between them and the green signal lights of the railway, the encampment blazed like the clustered lights of a small town. But Thresk learned more than the facts. The springs of conduct were disclosed to him. The woman revealed herself. Dark places were made light, and he bowed himself beneath a new burden of remorse. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 Two Strangers. You came back to the tent, she began, and ever since then you have misunderstood what you saw. For this is the truth. I was going to kill myself. Thresk was startled as he had not expected to be and a great wave of relief swept over him and uplifted his soul. Here was the simplest explanation, yet it had never occurred to him. Always he had been besieged by the vision of Stella, standing quietly by the table, deliberately preparing her rifle for use. Always he had linked up that vision with the death of Stephen Ballantyne in a dreadful connection. He did not doubt that she spoke the truth now. Looking at her, and noticing the anguish of her face, he could not doubt it. So definite a premeditation as he had imagined there had not been, and relief carried him to pity. So it had come to that, he said. Yes, replied Stella, and you had your share in bringing it to that, you who sit in judgment. I, Thresk exclaimed. Yes, you who sit in judgment. I am not alone. No, I am not alone. A crime was committed. 
then you must shoulder your portion of the blame thresk asked himself in vain what was his share he had done a cowardly thing years ago a few miles from this spot he had never ceased to reproach himself for the cowardice but that it had lived and worked like some secret malady until in the end it had made him an all unconscious accomplice in that midnight tragedy a sharer in its guilt if guilt there were here again was news for him but the knowledge which her first words had given to him that all these years he had never got the truth of her kept him humble now he ceased to be judge he became pupil and as pupil he answered her i am ready to shoulder it he was seated on a cushioned bench which stood behind the writing-table and stella sat down at his side when we parted that morning it was in the drawing-room over there in my cottage we parted you to your work of getting on henry i to think of you getting on without me at your side there was a letter lying on the table a letter from india jane repton had written it and she asked me to go out to her for the cold weather i went i was a young girl lonely and very unhappy and as young girls often do who are lonely and very unhappy i drifted into marriage i see said thresk in a hushed voice the terrible conviction grew upon him now lurid as the breaking of a day of storm that the cowardice he had shown on bignor hill ruined her altogether and hurt him not at all yes i see there my share begins oh no not yet she answered then i spoke when i should have kept silence i let my heart go out when i should have guarded it no i cannot blame you but you have the right none the less but stella would not excuse herself now and to him by any subtlety or artifice no i married that was my affair i was beaten despised ridiculed terrified by a husband who drank secretly and kept all his drunkenness for me that too was my affair but i might have gone on for seven years it had lasted i was settling into a dull habit of misery i might have gone on being bullied and tortured had not one little thing happened to push me over the precipice and what was that asked thresk your visit to me at chitipur she replied and the words took his breath away why he had travelled to chitipur merely to save her he leaned forward eagerly but she anticipated him she smiled at him with an indulgent forgiveness oh why did you come but i know do you thresk asked here at all events she was wrong yes you came because of that one weak soft spot of sentimentalism there is in all of you the strongest the hardest you are strong for years you live alone for years then comes the sentimental moment and it's we who suffer not you and deep in thresk's mind was the terror of the mistakes people make in ignorance of each other and of the mortal hurt the mistakes inflict he had misread stella here she was misreading him and misreading him in some strange way to her peril and ruin you are sure of that he asked she had no doubt no more doubt than he had had of the reason why she stood preparing her rifle quite she answered you had heard of me in bombay and it came over you that you would like to see how the woman you had loved looked after all these years whether she retained her pretty way whether she missed you ah above all whether she missed you you wanted to fan up into a mild harmless flame the ashes of an old romance warm your hands at it for half an hour recapture a savour of dim and pleasant memories and then go back to your own place and your own work untouched and unhurt thresk laughed aloud with bitterness at the mistake she had made yet he could not blame her there was a certain shrewd insight which though it had led her astray in this case might well have been true in any other case might well have been true of him he remembered her disbelief in all that he had said to her in that tent at chitipur 
and he was appalled by the irony of things and the blind and feeble helplessness of men to combat it so that's why i came to chitipur he cried yes stella answered without a second of hesitation but i couldn't be left untouched and unhurt you came and all that i had lost came with you came in a vivid rush of bright intolerable memories she clasped her hands over her eyes and thresk lived over again that evening in the tent upon the desert but with a new understanding his mind was illumined he saw the world as a prison in which each living being is shut off from his neighbour by the impenetrable wall of an inability to understand memories of summers here she resumed of women friends of dainty and comfortable things and days of great happiness when it was good oh so very good to be alive and young and you were going back to it all straight by the night mail to bombay straight from the station on board your ship oh how it hurt to hear you speak of it with a casual pleasant word about exile and next-door neighbours she clasped her hands together in front of her her fingers worked and twisted no i couldn't endure it she whispered the blows the ridicule the contempt i determined should come to an end that night and when you saw me with the rifle in my hand i was going to end it yes and then the stupidest thing happened i couldn't find the little box of cartridges stella described to him how she had run hither and thither about the tent opening drawers looking into bags and growing more nervous and more flurried with every second that passed she had so little time ballantyne was not going as far as the station with thresk he merely intended to see his visitor off beyond the edge of the camp and it must be all over and done with before he came back she heard ballantyne call to thresk to sit firm while the camel rose and still she had not found them she heard thresk's voice saying good night the last words henry i wanted to hear in the world i thought that i would wait for them and that the moment they had died away then but i hadn't found the cartridges and so the search began again thresk watching her as she lived through again those desperate minutes was carried back to chitipur and seemed to be looking into that tent he had a dreadful picture before his eyes of a hunted woman rushing wildly from table to table with a white quivering face and lips which babbled incoherently and feverish hands which darted out nervously oversetting books and ornaments in a vain search for a box of cartridges wherewith to kill herself she found them at last behind the whisky bottle and clutched at them with a great sigh of relief she carried them over to the table on which she had laid her rifle and as she pushed one into the breach stephen ballantyne stood in the doorway of the tent he swore at me stella continued i had taken the necklace off i had shown you the bruises on my throat he cursed me for it and he asked me roughly why i didn't shoot myself and rid him of a fool i stood without answering him that always maddened him I didn't do it on purpose. I had become dull and slow. I just stood and looked at him stupidly, and in a fury he ran at me with his fist raised. I recoiled. He frightened me. And then before he reached me, yes. Her voice died away in a whisper. Thresk did not interrupt. There was more for her to tell and one dreadful incident to explain. Stella went on in a moment, looking straight in front of her, and with all the passion of fear gone from her voice. I remember that he stood and stared at me foolishly for a little while. I had time to believe that nothing had happened, and to be glad that nothing had happened, and to be terrified of what he would do to me. And then he fell and lay quite still. It seemed that she had no more to say, that she meant to leave unexplained the inexplicable thing, and even Thresk put it out of his thoughts. "'It was an accident, then,' he cried. "'After all, Stella, it was an accident.' But Stella sat mutely at his side. Some struggle was taking place in her, and was reflected in her countenance. 
Thresk's eager joy was damped. No, my friend, she said at length, slowly and very deliberately, it was not an accident. But you fired in fear, Thresk caught now at that alternative. You shot in self-defence, Stella. I blundered at Bombay. He moved away from her in his agitation. I am sorry. Oh, I am very sorry. I should never have come forward at all. I should have lain quiet and let your counsel develop his case as he was doing, on the line of self-defence. You would have been acquitted, and rightly acquitted. You would have had the sympathy of everyone. But I didn't know your story. I was afraid that the discovery of Ballantyne outside the tent would ruin you. I knew that my story could not fail to save you. So I told it. But I was wrong, Stella. I blundered. I did you a great harm. He was standing before her now, and so poignant an anguish rang in his voice that Stella was moved by it to discard her plans. Thus she had meant to tell the story, if ever she was driven to it. Thus she had told it. But now she put out a timid hand and took him by the arm. I said I would tell you the truth, but I have not told it all. It's so hard not to keep one little last thing back. Listen to me and with a bowed head and her hand still clinging desperately to his arm, she made the final revelation. It's true I was crazy with fear, but there was just one little moment when I knew what I was going to do, when it came upon me that the way I had chosen before was the wrong one, and this new way the right one. No, no, she cried as Thresk moved, even that's not all. That moment you could hardly measure it in time. Yet to me it was distinct enough, and is marked distinctly in my memories, for during it he drew back. "'What?' cried Thresk. "'Don't say it, Stella.' "'Yes,' she answered. "'During it he drew back, knowing what I was going to do, just as I suddenly knew it. It was a moment when he seemed to me to bleat—yes, that's the word—to bleat for mercy.' She had told the truth now and she dropped her hand from his sleeve. "'And you, what did you do?' asked Thresk. "'I? Oh, I went mad, I think. When I saw him lying there I lost my head. The tent was flecked with great spots of fire which whirled in front of my eyes and hurt. A strength far greater than mine possessed me. I was crazy. I dragged him out of the tent for no reason. That's the truth. For no reason at all. Can you believe that?' Yes, replied Thresk readily enough, I can well believe that. Then something broke, she resumed. I felt weak and numbed. I dragged myself to my room. I went to bed. Does that sound very horrible to you? I had one clear thought only. It was over. It was all over. I slept. She leaned back in her chair. Her hands dropped to her side. Her eyes closed. Yes, I did actually sleep. A clock ticking upon the mantel-shelf seemed to grow louder and louder in the silence of the library. The sound of it forced itself upon Thresk. It roused Stella. She opened her eyes. In front of her Thresk was standing, his face grave and very pitiful. "'Now answer me truly,' said Stella, and leaning forward she fixed her eyes upon him. "'If you still loved me, would you, knowing this story, refuse to marry me thresk looked back across the years of her unhappy life and saw her as the sport of a malicious destiny no he said i should not then why shouldn't dick marry me because he doesn't know the story stella nodded her head yes there's the flaw in my appeal to you i know you are quite right I should have told him. I should tell him now. And suddenly she dropped on her knees before Thresk. The tears burst from her eyes, and in a voice broken with passion she cried, But I daren't, not yet. I have tried to, oh, more than once. Believe that, Henry. You must believe it. But I couldn't. I hadn't the courage. You will give me a little time, won't you? Oh, not long. I will tell him of my own free will, very soon, Henry.' 
but not now not now the sound of her sobbing and the sight of her distress wrung thresk's heart he lifted her from the ground and held her there is another way stella he said gently oh i know she answered she was thinking of the little bottle with the tablets of veronal which stood by her bed not for the first time that night she did not stop to consider whether thresk too had that way in his mind it came to her so naturally it was so easy so simple a way she never thought that she misunderstood she had come to the end of the struggle the battle had gone against her she recognized it and now without complaint she bowed her head for the final blow the inherited habit of submission taught her that the moment had come for compliance and gave her the dignity of patience yes i suppose that i must take that way she said and she walked towards the chair over which she had thrown her wrap good night henry but before she had thrown the cloak about her shoulders thresk stood between her and the window he took the cloak from her hands there have been too many mistakes stella between you and me there must be no more here are we until tonight strangers and because we were strangers and never knew it, spoiling each other's lives. Stella looked at him in bewilderment. She had taught Thresk that night unimagined truths about herself. She was now to learn something of the inner secret man which the outward trappings of success concealed. He led her to a sofa and placed her at his side. "'You have said a good many hard things to me, Stella,' he said with a smile. "'Most of them true, but some untrue. "'And the untrue things you wouldn't have said "'if you had ever chanced to ask yourself one question. "'Why I really missed my steamer at Bombay.' "'Stella Ballantyne was startled. "'She made a guess but faltered in the utterance of it, "'so ill it fitted with her estimate of him.' you missed it on purpose yes i didn't come to chitipur on any sentimental journey and he told her how he had seen her portrait in jane repton's drawing-room and learned of the misery of her marriage i came to fetch you away and again stella stared at him you you pitied me so much oh henry no i wanted you so much it's quite true that I sacrificed everything for success. I don't deny that it is well worth having. But Jane Repton said something to me in Bombay, so true. You can get whatever you want if you want it enough, but you cannot control the price you will have to pay. I know, my dear, that I paid too big a price. I trampled down something better worth having. Stella rose suddenly to her feet. Oh, if I had known that on the night in Chitipur, what a difference it would have made! She turned swiftly to him. Couldn't you have told me? I hadn't a chance. I hadn't five minutes with you alone. And you wouldn't have believed me if I had had the chance. I left my pipe behind me in order to come back and tell you. I had only the time then to tell you that I would write. Yes, yes, she answered, and again the cry burst from her what a difference it would have made merely to have known that you really wanted me she would never have taken that rifle from the corner and searched for the cartridges that she might kill herself whether she had consented or not to go away and ruin thresk's future she would have had a little faith wherewith to go on and face the world if she had only known but up on top of bignor hill a blow had been struck under which her faith had reeled and it had never had a chance of recovery. She laughed harshly. The heart of her tragedy was now revealed to her. She saw herself the sport of gods, who sat about like cruel louts, torturing a helpless animal, and laughing stupidly at his sufferings. She turned again to Thresk, and held out her hand. "'Thank you. You would have ruined yourself for me.' "'Ruin's a large word,' he answered and still holding her hand he drew her down again she yielded reluctantly she might misread his character but when the feelings and emotions were aroused she had the unerring insight of her sex she was warned by it now she looked at thresk with startled eyes 
why have you told me all this she asked in suspense ready for flight i want to prepare you there's a way out of the trouble the honest way for both of us to make a clean breast of it together and together take what follows she was on her feet and away from him in a second no no she cried in alarm and thresk mistook the cause of the alarm you can't be tried again stella that's over you have been acquitted she temporized but you i and he shrugged his shoulders i take the consequences i doubt if they would be so very heavy there would be some sympathy and afterwards it would be as though you had slipped down from chitipur to bombay and joined me as i had planned we can make the best of our lives together there was so much sincerity in his manner so much simplicity she could not doubt him and the immensity of the sacrifice he was prepared to make overwhelmed her it was not merely scandal and the divorce court which he was ready to brave now he had gone beyond the plan contemplated at bombay he was willing to go hand in hand with her into the outer darkness laying down all that he had laboured for unsparingly you would do that for me she said oh you put me to shame and she covered her face with her hands you gave up your struggle for a footing in the world that's what you want isn't it he pleaded and she drew her hands away from her face he believed that he imagined that she was fighting just for a name a position in the world she stared at him in amazement and forced herself to understand since he himself had cared for her enough to remain unmarried since the knowledge of the mistake which he had made had grown more bitter with each year he had fallen easily into that other error that she had never ceased to care too we'll make something of our lives never fear he was saying but to marry this man for his position and he not knowing oh my dear i know how you are driven but it won't do it won't do she stood in silence for a little while one by one he had torn her defences down she could hardly bear the gentleness upon his face and she turned away from him and sat down upon a chair a little way off stand there henry she said a strange composure had succeeded her agitation i must tell you something more which i meant to hide from you the last thing which i have kept back it will hurt you i'm afraid there came a change upon thresk's face he was steeling himself to meet a blow go on it isn't because of his position that i cling to dick i want him to keep that yes for his sake i don't want him to lose more by marrying me than he needs must and comprehension burst upon henry thresk you care for him then you really care for him so much she answered that if i lost him now i should lose all the world you and i can't go back to where we stood nine years ago you had your chance then henry if you would wish to take it but you didn't wish it and that sort of chance doesn't often come again others like it yes but not quite the same one i am sorry but you must believe me if i lost dick i should lose all the world so far she had spoken very deliberately but now her voice faltered that is my one poor excuse the unexpected word roused thresk to inquiry excuse he asked and with her eyes fixed in fear upon him she continued yes i meant dick to marry me publicly but i saw that his father shrank from the marriage i grew afraid i told dick of my fears he banished them i let him banish them what do you mean thresk asked we were married privately in london five days ago thresk uttered a low cry and in a moment stella was at his side all her composure gone oh i know that it was wrong but i was being hunted they were all like a pack of wolves after me mr hazelwood had joined them i was driven into a corner i loved dick they meant to tear him from me without any pity i clung yes i clung but thresk thrust her aside you tricked him he cried i didn't dare to tell him stella pleaded wringing her hands i didn't dare to lose him 
you tricked him thresk repeated and at the note of anger in his voice stella found herself again you accuse and condemn me she asked quietly yes a thousand times yes he exclaimed hotly and she answered with another question winged on a note of irony because i tricked him or because i married him thresk was silenced he recognized the truth implied in the distinction he turned to her with a smile yes he answered you are right stella it's because you married him he stood for a moment in thought then with a gesture of helplessness he picked up her cloak she watched his action and as he came towards her she cried but i'll tell him now henry in a way she owed it to this man who cared for her so much who was so prepared for sacrifice if sacrifice could help that morning on the downs was swept from her memory now yes i'll tell him now she said eagerly since henry thresk set such store upon that confession why so very likely would dick her husband too but thresk shook his head what's the use now you give him no chance you can't set him free and stella was as one turned to stone all argument seemed sooner or later to turn to that one dread alternative which had already twice that night forced itself on her acceptance yes i can henry and i will i promise you if he wishes to be free i can do it quite easily quite naturally any woman could so many of us take things to make us sleep there was no boastfulness in her voice or manner but rather a despairing recognition of facts good god you mustn't think of it said thresk eagerly that's too big a price to pay stella shook her head wistfully you hear it said henry she answered with an indescribable wistfulness that women will do anything to keep the men they love they'll do a great deal i am an example but not always everything sometimes love runs just a little stronger and then it craves that the loved one shall get all he wants to have if dick wants his freedom i too then shall want him to have it and while thresk stood with no words to answer her there came a knocking upon the door it was gentle almost furtive but it startled them both like a clap of thunder for a moment they stood rigid then thresk silently handed stella her cloak and pointed towards the window he began to speak aloud a word or two revealed his plan to stella ballantyne he was rehearsing a speech which he was to make in the courts before a jury but the handle of the door rattled and now old mr hazelwood's voice was heard thresk are you there once more thresk pointed to the window but stella did not move let him in she said quietly and with a glance at her he unlocked the door mr hazelwood stood outside he had not gone to bed that night he had taken off his coat and now wore a smoking jacket i knew that i should not sleep to-night so i sat up he began and i thought that i heard voices here over thresk's shoulder he saw stella ballantyne standing erect in the middle of the room her shining gown the one bright patch of colour you here he cried to her and thresk made way for him to enter he advanced to her with a look of triumph in his eyes you here at this house with thresk you were persuading him to continue to hold his tongue stella met his gaze steadily no she replied he was persuading me to the truth and he has succeeded mr hazelwood smiled and nodded there was no magnanimity in his triumph a schoolboy would have shown more chivalry to the opponent who was down you confess then good richard must be told yes answered stella i claim the right to tell him but mr hazelwood scoffed at the proposal oh dear no he cried i refuse the claim i shall go straight to richard now he had actually taken a couple of steps towards the door before stella's voice rang out suddenly loud and imperative take care mr hazelwood after you have told him he will come to me take care hazelwood stopped 
Certainly that was true. I'll tell Dick tomorrow, here, in your presence, she said, and if he wishes it, I'll set him free and never trouble either of you again. Hazelwood looked at Thresk and was persuaded to consent. Reflection showed him that it was the better plan. He himself would be present when Stella spoke. He would see that the truth was told without embroidery. Very well, tomorrow, he said. Stella flung the cloak over her shoulders and went up to the window. Thresk opened it for her. I'll see you to your door, he said. The moon had risen now. It hung low with the branches of a tree like a lattice across its face, and on the garden and the meadow lay that unearthly light which falls when a moonlit night begins to drown in the onrush of the dawn. No, she said, I would rather go alone. But do something for me, will you? Stay to-morrow. Be here when I tell him. She choked down a sob. Oh, I shall want a friend, and you are so kind. So kind, he repeated, with a note of bitterness. Could there be praise from a woman's lips more deadly? You are kind. You are put in your place in the ruck of men. You are extinguished. Oh, yes, I'll stay. She stood for a moment on the stone flags outside the window. "'Will he forgive?' she asked. "'You would. And he is not so very young, is he? It's the young who don't forgive. Good night.' She went along the path and across the meadow. Thresk watched her go and saw the light spring up in her room. Then he closed the window and drew the curtain. Mr. Hazelwood had gone. Thresk wondered what the morrow would bring. After all, Stella was right. Youth was a graceful thing of high-sounding words and impetuous thoughts, but like many other graceful things, it could be hard and cruel. Its generosity did not come from any wide outlook on a world where there is a good deal to be said for everything. It was rather a matter of physical health than judgment. Yes, he was glad Dick Hazelwood was half his way through the thirties. For himself, well, he knew his business. It was to be kind. He turned off the lights and went to bed. End of chapter 26